Joining us today on Beyond Turning Points is Karima Eames. Karima is an experienced holistic therapist, author, and passionate seeker of truth. With over three and a half decades of dedication to inner transformation, Karima has been a guiding light for many in their journey towards self-discovery. Born in post-war Germany, her early exposure to complex trauma ignited a drive to find the light within herself and others. This search took her to India, where she spent 20 years teaching the exploration of the inner world at the Mystery School. Karima is based in Sydney, Australia, and has committed her life to facilitating transformation and connecting to the voice of the heart. Her recently published book, Becoming Whole, The Art of Inner Transformation, is a testament to her 40-year journey and describes inner alchemy in a way that helps others to skillfully navigate their own path. Karima continues to be a beacon for many and hosts her own podcasts, which is also called Becoming Whole, The Art of Inner Transformation, and that's available on all streaming services. Welcome, Karima. Oh, welcome, Ash. That's a beautiful intro. Thank you. Uh, it's a, a beautiful intro to write, so yeah. <laughs> and um, you've been a beacon in my life as well. So we, we started working... Well, I started working with you and you with me, of course, but me as a client of yours, yeah, probably a year ago. And it's, yeah, it's, I think so. Um, mm, yeah. And it's been, been a beautiful gift for me. So I wanted to acknowledge that for the it's listeners. Great working with you. Yeah. Thank you. So we might, um, seeing as the podcast is called Beyond Turning Points, and it seems to be this trend that's starting. With, with the podcast is starting with the one of the key turning points for you. And I'm curious what that might be. That is very simple. That was when I was 21. I was studying. I always wanted to know how we tick. I had that longing already as a teenager. And when I left school, it was clear that I wanted to learn more about human psychology so I studied psychology but it was very unrewarding and honestly quite boring and I remember my half diploma I found it at some point a few years ago it was so boring on rats and whatever it, it wasn't really what I was looking for so while I was studying I started reading books that were out at that time like one was I am okay you're okay by George Harris which is about transactional analysis. And I thought, wow, that is amazing. And so I started experimenting with meditations. I did a bit of um, transcendental and just I was sniffing around trying to find something. I had no idea yet about meditation. And then I was living in a shared house with some very lovely people. And one of them said, there is this group in Munich let's go and do it. And I said, okay, I had no idea what to expect. So I did a five day group, very intense with a lot of breath work, bioenergetics, the heavy duty, big opening stuff. And then I said two more days for another workshop. So I was seven days in intense work, inner work. And I couldn't believe how I felt afterwards and during, like I learned to about energy and energy flow and a whole world opened up that I had no idea about because at that time I was still I lived in my head I wasn't really connected to my body I exercised but I didn't really understand how to be in the body as I do now and I had no clue how to feel I was just thinking and then suddenly this inner world opened up in a kaboom like it was so massive like a chosen earthquake. And I had touched on things. Like I remember feeling right after I was so grounded and so centered. I had no idea at that time was the be what the being center was. But I was so sitting in myself and feeling, wow, there is something more. And then I found out where the people who were running the workshop had learned. And that was in India, in the Osho commune. And so I decided it was not quite easy. For half a year, I was in this big dialogue, head heart, my head goes, 
no way, no way, no way. Do not go to India. You don't want to go to Guru and Ashram and all this stuff. No way. And my heart was, I need to go. I need to go. I need to go. And that went on for quite a while. And my heart won. Mm -hmm. And I left. And then my life changed forever after that. Mm -hmm. So, and how was it arriving in India from Germany? It was crazy. Like the, for a German structured, efficient thinking person, just arriving at the airport, the first moment you end, leave the aeroplane, everybody knows that who went to, goes to India for the first time. The stink that hits your nose is just unreal. And so I was prepared. I had, I had a tissue with eucalyptus oil or something, but it smells not good. And then the noise and the colors and then the drive was a taxi, the first one. Like, I'm surprised that we're all still alive. It was so wild and crazy. Indians drive, I call it slalom. They drive wherever there is a space, not like German structure on the right side and whatever, and you take over on the left. It was just crazy. So it was a big, big shock to the senses and exciting because it was so completely different to anything I've ever learned and have known. And then when I arrived in Pune for the very first time, and there's something called the gateless gate. It's a big, massive wooden gate. It's gorgeous with ornaments and stuff. And when I entered through the gate into the ashram or commune for the very first time, I just felt something that I had never felt before. There was what I le later learned to call a Buddha field. And you stepped into it and it was like, wow. This is home. And so that was my very first impression. And then I started being there and doing my first groups. And I just very soon realized that the people who, are, who were there are like me, seekers, you know, seekers of truth from all parts of the world. And often in our where we were, we feel like the, I don't know, not fitting, you know, because I had always this longing for something more. And I felt incredibly at home. And I was supposed to only go for three months in my term break. And I loved it so much that I stayed five. I did pretty much every group that was on offer at that time, like 13 different groups, just painting and who is in and everything they had. Just I was hungry. And then I decided I want to stay there for good which then led to a few more steps I had to come back and whatever. But it was really so captivating and touching something deep in me that I felt, yeah, this is where I want to be and want to stay. I felt home. Mm -hmm. And I'm always curious because I, when I went to India, I, I loved the chaos. So I was like, oh, when I arrived, I was like, yes, this feels real. This feels like humans. It feels yeah. feels more more how people should live than than here in Australia, where you know, there's a million signs and there's everybody sits in their lane and nobody honks their horn. And <laughs> and if they do honk their horn, it's because they're angry and then the people yeah. respond with anger. Yeah. And did it take you long to see the, the structure in the chaos and become comfortable with that? I learned to love it, absolutely. After living there, in the end, I was 20 years in the commune and 10 years real time in India. The rest was in Cologne. And in that time, I totally learned to love India. The smells, the colors, the chaos. The, it was so refreshing somehow. Like we often laugh, you know, in India, you expect things to go wrong. And it was the total opposite for my conditioning, and I learned to love it. And when I would come back to Germany, which I often did back and forth, and arrive in Frankfurt, I was thinking, this is so sterile. This is so boring. Where's the smell, the sounds, the colors? The... It, I absolutely learned to love it. Mm -hmm. Little story, even when I eventually landed in Australia, I was so 
in my heart. I was so attached to India still. I watched Bollywood movies just to get a little bit of you know the Indian dolls and stuff. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's interesting how the conditioning works in that what we reject. So what we're taught is what we reject. Do you yeah. have any insights on that? Yeah, I mean, it was honestly the opposite to German conditioning. And then learning so many amazing things there and loving my time there in the ashram, it just shook it all up. I went to the other polarity. And then when I came to Australia, I thought Australia meets in the middle. It's not as structured as Germany, not as chaotic as India. So it was like a really nice middle way between the two extremes. And yeah, it was a big, big um, shock to my original conditioning, but wonderful because it's just so colorful and the smells, there's always incense. And I mean, the first smell was different on the mm -hmm. airport. But India is full of nice fragrances and incense smells and then the beautiful, colorful saris. And it's just a very rich culture. And often I felt Indians are more like kids, more playful, more childlike still, more. Yeah, it was, was very interesting to discover mm. that. Yeah, I remember landing in, in the and actually I went we went from the airport straight to Pune as well to the ashram and the the taxi was just just outside the airport there was an area that had just been bulldozed and everybody was getting their belongings and they're all on the back of the trucks and and I just thought wow the, these people's houses have just been bulldozed and all their belongings were on trucks and on the side of the road and they're standing next to them and it was just such a such a different experience of humanity. Oh, totally. You also learn to accept begging as a normal profession there. You know, it's just, we had one beggar, especially on the way to the ashram, there was his place and we all knew him. And I think he did really well because we all supported him. Hmm. And often I was wondering like, from the Western achieving mind, you always think it you should have a lot. But I was often watching, there was one big bridge in Corrigan Park and there were very poor people living under the bridge in simple circumstances. What struck me often that they looked happy. The kids were smiling. I thought, how is that possible? It shouldn't be possible. So many of the things I witnessed there blew my mind and shook up a lot of original German conditioning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember a, a shop inside a shipping container and everything was very well lined up and very neat. It was clothing and, and Indian ornaments and things. Mm -hmm. And I, from the outside, I thought, ah, this poor shopkeeper, the, you know, he's he's shops in a in a shipping container, and then I went in and we started talking, and he was so proud and and just was so happy, and his perspective was I've made it, and I just, I, I was like oh wow I I have this so wrong I've been conditioned to think that making it is something else, whereas here's this man, and he was probably about thirty, and he was just so happy to have this this shop in the in mm. the shipping container and my western mind had been thinking oh how can i help this man you know and he was perfectly happy yeah it definitely shakes up a lot of western conditioning mm -hmm. and the biggest gift of india and osho was talking about that a lot is it has such an ancient history of meditation and you feel that in the air like there are ashrams everywhere meditation is normal praying is normal and that's the vibe that you feel there. I definitely felt it. Mm. And my mom was visiting at some point in the 90s. And she even felt it. She said, there's something in the air and it's so relaxing. And so it's that ancient meditation background that is in the air. And 
Osho always talked about the West and the East, they need to come together, get the best of both sides and merge it in. I'm absolutely agreeing with that. Mm. Because the, the depth of meditation that is in the country and normal is missing or was missing at that time in the West. Now it's changing. Some meditation has become mainstream, but at that time it wasn't. And yeah, and then the Indian system has faults and can be very chaotic and around the health system and many, many different things. Mm. And so the, the Western understanding can bring a bit more structure and efficiency. <laughs> And they could come together, the best of both sides, and that would be perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wonder what countries in the world are more like that, where they're both more integrated. My hunch is, I, I mean, Bali, for example, stood out for me when I, I haven't been there for a long time now, but about 18, 19 years ago, because they start the day with prayer and I always loved that and they have also tons of temples and so Bali had a vibe when I was there where I thought this is a bit closer to an integrated state mm -hmm. and what was your daily life like in the ashram what, what was a typical day I mean that had nothing to do with India per se because we had a very specific structure in the ash ashram and there were people from all over the world, so it was international. But it was very structured, actually, <laughs> actually very structured. Mm -hmm. um, so we would start with a very active dynamic meditation at six o'clock in the morning, and that became normal. So no matter how I felt, I would get up, be there for six, six till seven, do the meditation, then shower, breakfast, and then for most of the time I was there, once I had done groups and decided to stay there, um, you would work and contribute. And so we would have different jobs and um, I went through different stages, different kinds of jobs in the beginning. And then at, when I was 30, I became a therapist and then that became my job to do sessions, run groups. But before that, I one of the things I really loved was uh, I was called kids mama so I took care of the two to four year old young ones and there was an incredible learning that was my first job actually when I started finishing my groups and wanting to work and I felt they were my first big meditation and presence teachers because they were just having fun and running around and we were just playing and I could really notice at that time when I wasn't present, my mind would go off somewhere and then I was like, now nah, be here again. So they really taught me to be more present. And I, I always loved that time. Like I had a fantastic time with taking care of kids and learning from them and, you know, just remembering playfulness again, because I had through all my intellectual identification forgotten about that mm. and I often say to clients they were the preparation for me to become then a therapist and counselor but um, I learned a lot from the kids yeah I often I often think about that Osho quote work is love made visible and that's a nice yeah, expression yeah yeah, yeah. And when I was there in the ashram, so there's a, um, people can go there and they work and that's their meditation. Do you yeah. want to describe so, that? Yeah. So for us, working was a commitment to become more conscious in daily life. So it's not like work somewhere else. And we weren't paid. Like the payment was like, free entry to the ashram or meditations or later when I was heading had bigger jobs I was having a place in the ashram so all my basic needs were provided but so I didn't work to be paid we worked to be really present and bring awareness to every little moment and I, there were some of the teachings were leave a place more beautiful than you found it so I learned to always wherever I go 
notice how the place is and see if I can make it more beautiful. Or if I walk past something, I pick it up, you know, anything that someone's dropped or um, it's just this respect for each moment and for everything you do. And it's not to achieve more and more and more and get promoted and get more money because it was all out of the picture. It was just to really be present, bring awareness to what you're doing. And so we would work roughly from nine to four with a lunch break. And then there was again time for meditation at 4.15 was Kundalini, which is like a shaking meditation. And that's also the time where I remember it's always so nice to sit and have a cup of chai. We had the most delicious Indian chai. And then every night for ever, evening meditation, which starts with dancing, uh, singing, and then one to two, sometimes two and a half hours in the early days, sitting and listening to Osho. And when he was still in the body, we were, he was there, obviously. And then after that, you go for dinner and hang out with your friends. And so it, that was the day. So I had, looking back, four hours a day meditation, the dynamic meditation, Kundalini mostly, and then the evening meditation. And meditation was woven into our life, into, it was just normal. And I loved it. It was incredible. What was that like being there when Osho was still in his body? It was incredible. For me, um, I remember the very first time I sat in Buddha Hall. I was in the back. Osho was in the front. And it was just such a feeling of love. And the funny thing is I projected my favorite grandfather on him because my grandfather, my maternal one, he had a heart of gold. And I loved him. He had just, he was an ex exquisite human being. And then when I saw Osho, it reminded me of that golden heart or the love. And it was just, it was just beautiful. He had an incredible presence and just sitting hundreds or sometimes thousands of people, you know, sitting together in meditation, it creates such an incredible energy field. And you would sit in that every night and actually a lot of healing and transformation happened just through sitting there and sometimes nightmarish, difficult meditations where it's like, oh, God. Mm -hmm. But you just keep showing up, you keep sitting, you can't run around, you can't get too fidgety. You, you have to stay sitting for once you are in there for whatever, one to two hours. And so there was a bit of a pressure cooker to stay with what's there, not even coughing. And so through that container, which is a bit like what Vipassana is now for many people, you just have to stay with it and sit and go in and face. And then through that, many, many, many breakthroughs happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's such a, such a interesting piece around human existence that the being with the pain and that is the, the doorway yes yeah totally yeah do you maybe i'll ask you about inner alchemy connected to that yeah. so how would you describe inner alchemy and is that linked to being with pain is that suffering is that being joy because that that's you know the piece is for most people that i know i don't want to say everybody but let's say everybody they want the joy they want the joy yeah, and absolutely. it's you know in our society it's it's pay for the joy and yeah. that doesn't seem to be that rewarding for most people no the i mean there were so many misunderstandings i came across and that we had to confront and undo a lot of western and collective conditioning and this trying to achieve joy or just feel joyful or just to feel good everybody has that and what you confront when you really sit and you can't cover it up you just have to face it you face whatever is there 
And then you discover through not resisting what is there, whatever that is, you then drop deeper and then you discover what I now call true nature, which is a place inside that doesn't suffer. And that took a long time to really scientifically, nearly empirically understand that that is true. Because I would have, like in the early days in Buddha Hall, sit sometimes and go, oh, that goes going, was busy. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, you don't know why it happened, how it happened, I would drop into something. For example, I remember an incredible softness or an okayness or a joyfulness or a beingness. There were many, many moments where it just, the old structure just cracked and opened and I would drop into a deeper truth which was still very unknown at that time I mean Osho talked about it he always said you are Buddhas you just don't know it and then suddenly you have these openings like wow that's why I'm doing this and then they give you courage because it is sometimes really obvious to keep showing up and sitting and then confronting whatever thoughts you're having or difficult emotions and then these breakthroughs. And when they happen more and more, they keep you going and encourage you. And then eventually I learned through all the work I've done that this place inside, which I call true nature, really is existing in all of us and there is no suffering there. And that did take a lot of time and challenging my old beliefs, and but it's the truth. And I kept checking whenever I would drop through later. Um, for example, let's say um, you're totally, the mind is really attacking you, you're in judgment or the mind is stressed. And then you drop into this softness or deep peace. And I would, whenever I dropped into these deeper states, check is that state that I had before, is that still here? And I could never find it. So over the years, I can now firmly say there is no stress, there is no unworthiness, no shame, no guilt, no doubt, um, resistance, a any form of suffering that we usually know or tension where we struggle. When you drop into true nature, it doesn't exist there. And I really am thorough. Like, I joked the other day, I actually should call myself an inner scientist, not a therapist. I'm very thorough. And so I felt like I was looking under rocks and behind. Like, Is that really possible? Like you drop through a place of unworthiness into this beautiful, peaceful, all okay state and just everything is fine. It's like, how is that possible? <laughs> so wow. after I had that often enough, and that was also what we were uh, teaching in the mystery school. That's the inner alchemy to move from a state of suffering towards a state of being that is okay. And the word alchemy originally comes from the Middle Ages, transforming baser metals into gold. And that's what we do with inner alchemy. It's like you start with any state of suffering, any. Use that bring presence to that, I call that, then the door opens, then you drop deeper, and sometimes you have to go through a few layers of feeling repressed emotions, healing the inner child, or just whatever shows up, you stay with that, you stay with whatever's coming up, layer by layer, you go deeper, and when you reach the deepest place, you're in true nature, and then you have the suffering stops, and you get your answers, Sometimes true nature dissolves the, the state of suffering. You know, when you're really under lots of judgment, attack, it just dissolves there. You don't have to do anything about it. If there's an issue in your life and you drop into true nature, it gives suggestions, resolution, guidance. It's like that's what needs to be done. So it always has the, the right support. Sometimes it's just, you just need to hang out in a bit of stillness or peace. And sometimes it's very um, motivating or giving you really a direction or, you know, you get insights and intuition when you're connected to true nature. So it's 
you can't pin it down. Like true nature is not one thing, but it's always ever good. That's what I just keep saying. You know, it's good and only ever good. You will never find something in there that's not good. And it's very hard to believe for this old conditioned mind, which divides the whole world into good and bad. And in true nature, that doesn't happen. This division, this, this, this striving to be good and the fear of being bad, it all dissolves there. And it's very hard to understand for the old conditioned mind. And it's only understood when you start doing the work. And that's why I keep saying direct experience is the best teacher. Everything I share now and what I wrote in the book is from my own direct experience. It's not theory. I've lived it. I've traveled that pathway often enough. I'm offering it to clients. I see them traveling it. It's really true that true nature exists. And you have to do the work. Like it, you don't find it just through thinking. You have to do the work and go in, come into the body, dare to feel, open your heart, all the basic steps. Then you get in touch with it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there was a very long answer. I don't know. I probably yeah. didn't answer what I was supposed to answer. It, it, well, I don't know if there is a supposed to on this <laughs> podcast. But uh, the... The inner alchemy, how is it, how does that work benefit by having somebody who has experience guide you? Say that again. So, um, so for example, if I sit and meditate and meditate and meditate, mm -hmm. or if I have someone who gives me a prompt or assistance to that meditation or that being present with myself. Yeah. Do you have anything to share about that? How, how that works or yeah, any, any benefits? Of sitting on your own? Um, well, of having, having someone to guide. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Um, so when you sit on your own, like I did for ages, I learned a lot of that inner traveling through sitting in my meditation. But when you facilitate someone's inner traveling, which is what I do, you know, I'm a, I sometimes call myself a tour guide on the inner. And my job is to make sure people travel safely and don't get eaten by a lion because there are some weird places inside where you can really struggle. Um, so the facilitated traveling shortcuts a lot of unnecessary suffering, things that when we just sit, we can get lost, we can get trapped, we can sit in resistance, we can sit in rejection of an emotion that wants to surface or just sit in a lot of physical pain and fight with that or whatever. So when we sit alone, which is brilliant, it's a fantastic practice, I think in combo with facilitated inner journeying, it's better because I had so many misunderstandings I came across and crack the nuts open regularly, you know? And then everything I learned that was a misunderstanding, I now share so people don't waste years on certain things. And so that, that people learn to navigate the inner world more skillfully, more fluidly. That's how I usually call it. And I can see that in clients that I've seen for a longer time, how they really get the tools, and I call them tools, and they apply them and then something that was maybe very crunchy and very uh, in the beginning, suddenly they know what to do or make a suggestion and then they do this and then I travel here. And then so the pathway from the conditioned mind into true nature opens up through doing the work. And that can happen through meditation on your own, absolutely. And it can happen through facilitation, a facilitation and the combo of both is the best. Because when people have, like, when I work as a therapist with them, they come in whatever rhythm they come. But in between, I always recommend their own practices, what I call it, homework. Things we came across that would help them always recommend doing your own meditation practice in whatever form. 
can be still with eyes closed. It can be for some people walking or exercising or doesn't have to be a sitting practice, but something where they use their time to turn in and connect with themselves. Yeah, something I've become more aware of from working with you is the when I go in and you're guiding, the you often use the colors, the essences. Are you happy to describe what the essences are as in how they can guide? I don't know if I'm expressing it very well. Okay. But yeah. I know what you mean. Um, so when we go in and we do connect to true nature, there are different pathways in. It's, we all have five senses. So we can look on the outer and we can look on the inner. So when we look at true nature, you can see colors or they're often described in certain colors. And objectively, many people getting in touch with a specific aspect of true nature, like there's one essence called red essence, the strength essence. Often people do see red light or the red energizing color, but there's no goal. You don't have to see it. You can also feel it. So some people feel more, they feel that warmth, that strength of red essence. Some people are very visual, they see the red spreading in their body or feel a fire in their belly. And then you can also hear it. So some people just get messages, you know, they might hear a strengthening message or you can do it or whatever. So the going in can happen through all the five senses. The taste and smell is the most, for most people, I think, unfamiliar. In my own experience, I hardly ever get that I taste true nature. Sometimes I get it as a freshness or like fresh water. Um, and very rarely I got fragrance. But so it's, you either see it, feel it or hear it. And seeing is very common. And then these different qualities get divided into different colors. Um, and this is all the teaching from the diamond approach, which is a very beautiful esoteric school. And every specific aspect has its own beneficial effect on us. So like red essence is strength, yellow essence is joy, um, white essence is healthy will, trust, um, green is compassion, pink can be precious love. So there are many different qualities and that's why in my world, when I worked on writing the book and trying to find a way to explain all this metaphysical esoteric stuff a bit more, I used the analogy of a treasure chest. Imagine a treasure chest with tons of gems, all the different colored gemstones in there. And then you open it and they're all sparkly and you have all the colors in there and all of them have a different meaning. And so you open the treasure chest and then get to know all the different treasures or gems that are available. So this is one way to explain true nature. Essences is another one. Um, it has a name in every tradition. Like in journey work, they call, Brendan Bass calls it source. It's the same thing. Every tradition will have a name for it because it's real everybody doing the work and really going in will discover it. And then they use different language, different symbology, but all describing the same thing mm. because it's real. Yeah. I'm thinking about across cultures, cultures and that human experience that goes across cultures. And I'm wondering, what are your thoughts around maybe what's your experience Right, rather than thoughts but what what do you feel around that you know that perspective that we're just here in this body and then we die or are we in here for a little while and we we get to drive this meat suit around for a while and then we leave and we go get another one or do you have any perspectives on that i do I am, um, through my own experience and going in a lot and deeper and deeper and having lots of collective experiences, past life memories, for me, by now it's a fact that we 
incarnate regularly and maybe for a very long time. And I actually call the body we're in the vehicle we drive in. And you have to take good care of your vehicle because if the car stops driving well, it's harder. Um, and I believe when we leave the body, we return to essence or to nature. And then I, I mean, this is my own personal belief. I also believe that there is, when we leave the body, there is a period of what I would call counseling, looking back at your life, examining how did it go? Well, you know, what did you learn? What could be tried again? So I actually believe in an evaluation, which is also confirmed through a book called Journey of Souls. I forgot the author now, but he has interviewed people in hypnotherapy and asked them questions about between lives. And for me, that makes total sense that you look and evaluate, but from a compassionate place not from a judgmental place like I grew up with Christianity, you know, who goes sins and then was I good enough? Do I go to heaven? Oh, no, no, you go to hell or you go to in between. And No, it's looked at from compassion. And then I believe we have a chance to come back and try the next lesson. And that life is like a school. And when I've, before I even knew more of all of this stuff, I always kept saying I'm a disciple of life. You know, life is the teacher. I learned from life all these different lessons and many different schools or modalities they confirm that, like quantum theory. And yeah. mm -hmm. so I definitely am believing in reincarnation and many different past lives and yeah, mm -hmm. that we've been around for a while. <laughs> Yeah, and is there is there an insight around what you think your lesson has been this lifetime so far? Oh yeah, definitely. Clear lesson this life was to wake up, not mm -hmm. muck around anymore. Like, um, I think it's a point in the journey on a soul level where you have to, when I look at from that higher perspective at the earth and life and all its opportunities, there's lots of things you need to try. You know, getting rich, being sick, killing yourself, who knows what, addictions, poverty. Um, there are many, many things that need to be experienced that are part of the overall human experience. And they just need to be experienced. And... I remember lives where I um, was searching for truth already and would go to monasteries or sit in forests or, you know, just searching. But then it was a split to the outer world. And so many, many lifetimes you experiment. And then there is, is a point where I feel in me on a soul level, it's time to wake up, no more mucking around, just focus on what's real, the deepest truth in you and that's been my commitment in this lifetime very strongly and it definitely would have been an evolution to this to that point where it's so strong that it's the only thing that matters that's my deepest commitment my deepest purpose and not um yeah not not swaying from that mm. And I'm super relieved that the time has come. It's like, and it wasn't easy always, you know? mm -hmm. but it was, yeah. It's it's it's, but it comes from a place that is not the head. It comes from deep inside, and that's why I also, and that's my personal understanding. I allow people to be where they are in their journey. When I first discovered this, I was a bit like a missionary when I went back to Germany. So, you have to. Oh, oh my god this is amazing and then I realized not everybody wants to hear this so then I learned to just say it to people where I felt there was some opening or was interesting for them and then otherwise I zipped up and um, now I lost my point yeah. I think that was beautifully expressed uh, yeah and your book is designed to help people 
Do I use the phrase wake up or open up or? Yeah, to my, my big passion now is because I really found the answer to my deepest questions, which is that true nature exists and that all suffering stops there. It doesn't mean that I'm always there, but I know true nature is always there. And if anything moves me away from it, I know how to get back to it. And that's my passion to help other people know that, find their way, fall in love with true nature, learn to trust it, that it's really there and it is an intrinsic goodness. And yeah, that's my big passion to help people find that. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And then the book is in a way a summary of everything I learned since I was 21. Every everything and then how I would teach or advise a new client with the, the easiest way to move in and because I made lots of mistakes and wasted lots of time with different things um, and just in a nutshell what the teaching is so the mind has to become friendly towards the inner world which I call the mind has to become a friend and when the mind resists going in or it's not interested, you can't do it. So the mind needs to support wanting to go in and then be curious and learn to put the inner judge, which we all have learned to put that out of the equation, move the judge to the side and just be curious. And then once the mind is friendly, we need to learn to come into the body all the deep transformational work, the direct experience, finding true nature happens through the body. It's not a thinking process. It's a feeling process. Like when an essence or an inner state moves through the body, we feel it. We know it. When you feel filled with peace or with tremendous love or with joy or with strength, you feel it. You know it. It's, it's empirical. So getting into the body is crucial in working through the body. Then we need to learn to open the heart, which is the most important piece, because I believe now if we don't learn to open our hearts, going in and really facing the more challenging parts like difficult repressed memories, difficult repressed emotions, when the heart isn't open, you will, it's impossible, I would say. So the heart needs to open and the heart has many, many, many qualities and gifts. It's a treasure chest in itself. And one biggest one is acceptance. So when the heart opens, we can accept, oh, I'm feeling this old pain right now. Oh, compassion for memory where you struggled when you were younger. So the heart has acceptance, compassion, kindness, gentleness. It has all the qualities that are needed to do the more difficult parts of the work. That's why without an open heart, I would say, forget it. It's you just stay stuck. You'll never go really in and deep. So the heart needs to open. And then through that, we learn to feel. So there's a whole science, what I call the art of feeling, to learn how to feel anger, pain, fear in a very scientific and easy way because there's a recipe that works. If you apply it, you get the result. If you don't apply it, you don't get the result. So we have to learn to feel in the right way, own our emotions, transform them. And then you need to, um, through all of that, you get in touch with history. So you need to learn to heal the inner child, which is unavoidable for anybody doing inner work. And then there are a few harder areas like trauma work, you know, when people had a lot of trauma, you need to use the trauma healing skills, which also shortcut a lot of yeah, processes because without trauma work, for example, before I learned that, we were trained in a specific way as therapists where it was a bit of a goal, like go deeper, going deeper is courageous, you know, that's that's the right thing. So be courageous, go in. And then when you learn trauma work, it works in such a gentle way when something deep and old, especially locked out, locked away trauma surfaces, 
it can be totally overwhelming and re-traumatizing when it's not done in the right way. So trauma healing skills are incredibly gentle, um, respectful, very aligned with the way when you work with the heart and through the heart. So that needs to be understood because otherwise you can create more harm and re-traumatize people. And then when all of that is done and you also understand one of the difficult areas in the inner world is called inner holes or deficiencies. Like when we go in and there's nothing and you feel there's this abyss or I have no clue who I am right now. When these places often open up, they also need to be understood. You can learn to navigate even those quite skillfully, easily, in the right way. When all that has happened, we are what I call our inner guidance system is activated. And then the head, the heart, and the being center, they work together. And then your deepest truth, true nature, starts guiding us from deep inside. But for, for to get the guidance, we need to do the other work to clear the way. Otherwise, our gut might say, don't do this, don't go there, do this, da, da. And it's like, uh-uh, nope, not listening. Or many people are scared of the truth in their belly. Or deeper truths, they're scared that they won't like it. So the head, the heart, and the being need to become a team, work together. And then you have the best inner compass because that will always guide you in the right direction for your specific truth. Because we're all different. And my truth is not somebody else's truth. But by listening to what's true for us, we find our true path. And... One thing I 100% learned to trust is that true nature is coming from an incredibly deep wisdom and it always wants the best for us and exactly guides us to fulfill what is our journey or what we really meant to learn in this lifetime. And so once that is activated, you're set up. It's like having a solid compass on whatever, an airplane, a boat, and then you find your way. And then the biggest joke is that through all of that, the steps I mentioned, which is the becoming whole part, you know, bringing pieces together, becoming more whole, then we drop more and more easily into being whole, the state of true nature that is already whole. There we don't have to do it anymore, but how do we get there? We get there through doing the work of becoming whole, putting the puzzle pieces together, and then, ah, oh, yes. And that's my fascination. That's what I love seeing when I work longer with clients, that that navigation is so fluid and easy. It's like, chip, 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 and walk back in true nature. Mm -hmm. So it works. And I am very scientific, <laughs> so I tested mm -hmm. everything. <laughs> uh, I think... It's you, proven. <laughs> yeah. And I think earlier you were talking about, you know, the the um, the how wonderful it'd be for East to meet West. And I see that in you that there's the scientist, the the yeah, official that's one, true. and then there's the the true experience of of the of meditation and trauma healing and, and things like that. Yeah. Karima, you're about to start free meditations yes. uh, online yes. and um, I'm assisting you which I'm yes. very privileged I'm very to happy do about that yeah and uh, do you want to talk about the heart group yeah so I've been running the heart group for about 15 years until about 2009 and maybe I need to start earlier when I first did my very first heart group it was the feeling in the room was incredible it was in the early 90s so I had already done a lot of other work and when I learned about being in the heart or opening the heart I thought this is it now I'm even more home I already felt very at home there but that was really where I felt that's how the inner world opens up and then I got trained in it and then I ran the group for a very long time and it's very dear to my heart <laughs> this group and I always loved being in a room with other people who want to open their heart 
and the energy field that gets created is just exquisite and it was a three-day group and usually there's in the beginning the first morning most people start crying we always had tissues because when the heart opens we soften and pain comes up and we close our heart because of past pain usually and then the heart opens more and people get to know the gifts of the heart fall in love with their own heart and then it gets really silly and funny like it's a group we would have so much fun in on day, day, day two or three laugh a lot and I felt the heart provides a space for so much beauty and I fell totally in love with my own heart and the depth of it and I've discovered so much over the last whatever 35 years and I know that the deeper you go the more amazing treasures you find and the biggest deepest one is unconditional love like when we go really deep inside you tap into what feels like the source of love it's not personal it's just unconditional love radiating out and it's exquisite so I love the process I love what it was like when I was facilitating it and I miss it because I'm now just doing individual or couple sessions and I thought I want I want to share this again I want people to know this and my biggest dream is of a heart-based humanity and whenever I hear that anywhere or see that or other groups or other people, there are lots of people who are doing heart-based work now, my heart sings. And that isn't left over from growing up in Germany after the war. And I always dreamt of a world without war. And the best way to do that is if we all open our hearts. Because when the heart is open, you... Deep down, there's such a sense of well-wishing or benevolence. Like when the heart is truly open, you cannot harm or hurt others. You cannot harm the planet. You cannot hurt animals. You, you can't exploit. Like the true deep heart is incredibly benevolent. And so my understanding is that it's a dream. If more people open their hearts and people are really connected to the truth of their heart, a lot of the suffering we are experiencing will fall away. And so I want to do my little share in contributing to helping people to be heart-based. And starting the heart group is one of the things to do there. Mm. And I just will share very simple meditations because heart meditations are simple. They're not hard work. And hope that people learn to fall in love with their own hearts hmm. which means their true nature yeah and how do people find the heart group um we have the facebook group and just called the heart group they can find that and then um they need to respect the rules and the guidelines that we have to keep it heart based and they can contact you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, and I'll put I'll put links in the show notes as yeah. well for anybody that wants to join. Yeah. And um, when you were talking about the work, it sounds like such a huge mountain. That, you know, that is there any advice you'd have for somebody that's interested in exploring inner alchemy around that um bottom line start going in like no that that was my big turning point when i did that first group i didn't know i had an inner world i was honestly just living in my head and thinking and then i discovered there's this incredible rich inner world so start going in in whatever way close your eyes or do any practice you hear or just start going in because once that turning in is happening and it's called the 180 degree turn where we move away from the outer orientation towards the inner then this the rest will slowly unfold and then find a good therapist or um get good guidance on how to do it in a easy way that you don't waste too much time and but just go in and experiment and and trust 
what you're discovering and the the biggest key probably what I call the master key to use is accept whatever you come across like the in all traditions they say resistance to what is is the only problem and so when people go in and they get to know anything in the inner world to experiment with accepting it and not resisting it and then from there it will all unfold but just go in mm -hmm. yeah i just write that down accept whatever you come across it's a it's a lesson that i learned time and time and time again oh. We're so trying to resist and then to remember again our oh, acceptance of whatever is here. Mm -hmm. And one last thing I want to say also, because the one of the biggest misunderstandings in the early days was striving for enlightenment, because in India we talk about enlightenment. So the striving for enlightenment is the biggest trap. The truth is, it's all about going in, relaxing in, letting go more, accepting more, relaxing into yourself, and then you drop into true nature. So it's not a striving, it's not an achieving, it's not moving towards a goal out there. It's the absolute opposite. And once that lands, the work unfolds better because we're so designed to achieve, you know, to effort to reach a goal. It's the opposite. But it has to be discovered. <laughs> you actually mm -hmm. need to go in, strive and effort and go, oh, you know, doesn't work. Why is it not working? Because it doesn't work for nobody. Stop it. Stop it. But you have to kind of run this out to then go, oh, and then suddenly you drop in deeper. Yeah, I noticed, I noticed for me, I forget that there's a pattern of, oh, I'm striving. Come in, relax. It's okay. Yeah. And then there'll be a place where I'm okay. And then I forget and then I have to learn the lesson again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thousands of times. Yeah. The I thing is I... also, it's many of the things I learned, they're all collective. We all suffer from the same stuff, same misunderstandings. And mm. it's such a joy then to share when with somebody else where they go, oh, right. Okay. And then they don't have to waste a few years on a specific piece because... It's the mm. same for all of us. Do you think, just quickly, last one, do you think that resisting is human nature or is it human conditioning? I believe it's human conditioning. Mm -hmm. Because if if we all grew up heart-based, our parents knew about it and they knew about the beauty of acceptance and that resisting doesn't really do the job then we would have learned it but we all learn resisting a lot of things and we do it with best intention you know when you have pain you resist it you want to make it better but that doesn't allow you then to meet it be present drop in and drop through so it is it's the achieving mind the the western conditioning that is so in all of all of us that constantly gets in the way and then the idea of there's a right way and a wrong way or it's something is good and something is bad and then you just divide yourself so being really present with what is and accepting it is a massive art but that's what we all learn when we do the work mm. yeah i feel i have a lot more work to do <laughs> we all do yeah. I always say the work will never stop for me. It's 45 mm. years now and yeah. I will keep learning till I die. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, Karima, thank you so much for coming on Beyond Turning Points. My pleasure. It's already been a gift to me to have you here and I look forward to sharing <laughs> it with others. So, I um, enjoyed it. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to experiencing supporting you with the heart group. Yes. I look forward to that too. Yeah. And, very curious what what will be created there and what will unfold mm, yeah there's already a beautiful group of people forming there so yeah yeah if you're listening out there and you're interested come and have a look on facebook for the heart group and yeah. and you can apply beautiful. all right thanks karima lovely to spend that time with you yeah thank you 
Bye.